Um, this is, uh, first I want to say, uh, many World Series rubbish. Um, <laughs> uh, and secondly, um, in the uh, picture of the enzyme uh, you showed with the, uh, when you were explaining the tunneling of the atom, um, what uh, happens, presumably that has a, an ele electron orbiting it, if we can use such terms, what ha happens to that electron when that, uh, when that atom tunnels across to the other part? Oh, yeah, no, the, the, the electrons have to shift as well because, you know, the pattern of bonding is shifted and so they, they, they shift around. But the, the general idea is that, you know, it's much easier for electrons to shift than for uh, atomic nuclei to shift because they're much lighter. And so, you know, the, the, the general idea is that when uh, uh, an atom shifts, the electrons rearrange themselves almost instantaneously to accommodate that new... So, so, it, doesn't, uh, so it doesn't tunnel with it? it no, it just no, that's right. No, it. they... they, they yeah, there's a sort of shift just in the pattern of the, the electron clouds throughout the molecule. Okay. Thank yeah. you. I'll well, stop there. Shout your question and I'll repeat it. So, um, in the uh, sort of quantum theory of smell, you're saying how the molecules of whatever it is you're smelling sort of vibrate in a certain way, which affects the way the electrons tunnel across to the nasal receptors. Just wondering what you meant by um, the molecules vibrating. <coughs> Yes, I am exactly that. That they shake around. Molecules do that all the time. Yeah, can I, I just um, better repeat the question? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So the question was about um, um, uh, quantum effects in smell and how the, whether, whether the molecule vibrations uh, help electron tunneling. And the question was whether the molecules themselves were, were physically vibrating. Yes, yes. And, and that is exactly what I mean, that they do. Um, all molecules are vibrating all the time. Um, you know, they, they, they all have uh, heat, basically, within them that is, that is causing them to vibrate. So, uh, so I do literally mean that. And molecules vibrate in very particular ways. Um, uh, so, you know, a simple molecule might sort of vibrate a water molecule, for example, you know, either like that or the, the atoms sort of shift one way and then the other like that. They have particular so-called modes of vibration that are very specific to, to, uh, to the molecule. So there's a whole spectrum of vibrations of different frequencies corresponding to different movements of the atoms. And the idea is that, the, uh, is that somehow the receptor molecule is sensing that whole spectrum. It's a bit like um, the spectrometers, really, that, that that chemists use to identify molecules from their vibrations. So it, they, literally, they are, the, the atoms are moving around. I think there was another question from up on high. Yes, so if you, yes, you. First of all, thank you for an incredibly interesting talk. Um, I wanted to ask, the mechanism of uh, the avian um, compass, which relied on entanglement, I've got the idea that it relies on a photon and on the retina. Is there any evidence to suggest that birds who are blind or at night are blind, the avian compass doesn't work as well or something like that? So the question is whether in the avian compass, uh, which we think works with a photon landing on the retina and kick-starting this mechanism, uh, whether it ceases to work when, if the bird is blind or its eyes are shut or it's, it's Yeah, nighttime. does anyone know about that? Do you know about that, Jim? I, I'm not an ornithologist. Um, um, yeah, well, funny you should say that, Phil. <laughs> um, well, first of all, to say, actually, the bird, certainly the European robin, migrates at night. Uh, but there's enough light around. It doesn't need very sort of bright light for you know single photons to activate it. There's a group uh, um, in in uh, in Germany uh, who who are carrying out research. They 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 capture these robins in mid migration, poor things, and put them in these special cages uh, and. Um, uh, surround them with these magnetic coils called Helmholtz coils, which can simulate the effects of the Earth's magnetic field. First of all, they have them arranged so the north and south of these poles are exactly opposite to the north and south of the Earth's magnetic field, so it cancels it out, and the birds don't know which way to go. Uh, and then they can mess with the birds' uh, sense, magnetic sense of direction, by moving these coils around. And, and, and what they do, they have these birds sitting in these uh, little sort of funnels uh, with... Uh, uh, well, there's different variations of this, what's called Emlyn funnels. Um, 
one variation, the one that I like best is there's uh, ink pads at the bottom of these, uh, these chambers. And as the birds flap their wings and try and escape, and they sort of shuffle up the sides of these uh, cones, they leave ink marks with their feet on the sides. And then the, the researchers can come the next day and see where there are most footprints to, to, to determine which direction the bird would really like to fly off in were it able to continue on its migratory journey. And that tells them the direction. And in the answer to question, they, they've designed these lovely little masks that they put over the robin's head that covers up its eyes to see uh, if indeed that works. And sure enough, when, when the uh, robin is, is covered up, there is no, it, it loses this ability to sense the Earth's magnetic field. I think the, the effect was discovered by accident. That's how they knew that it was something to do with activated by vision. Uh, the, the robins were transported in, in the dark somewhere by, I think, the, the Vilchkos, the husband and wife team who first carried out uh, these experiments, long before they thought anything quantum mechanical was going on. Uh, so yes, I've, I've, I've even seen uh, some of these little masks. We're not allowed to, to to, to, to go and disturb the robins because they're stressed enough as it is <laughs> with these, <laughs> these masks on them, put it in a cage and, and, and want to carry on their journey. So, so having so humans prodding around as well, but I've, I've held at least held one of the masks. And obviously those, that experiment we've done with fruit flies, which also... That, that becomes a whole other level fruit flies. of... Although you'd be amazed at what you can do with... I've been to Scott Waddle's lab and you know, what you can do and make with, for fruit flies is but, extraordinary. They, they, don't they electrocute their feet or something? Is that, they do, yeah. Yes, yes, just yes. you know, to give them electric shocks. Yes. Don't go that way. Yes. They? <laughs> Funnily enough, they learn quickly. Yes. <laughs> okay, let's have some more questions. Sorry. Oh, my, my question. Oh, sorry. To that one. Well, while well, we're on that subject. Sure. If I've understood it properly, the, um, the photon falling on the robin's uh, retina causes there to be two or more free radicals one of which appears to be aligned with the Earth's magnetic field, so it's using that as a reference, the way I've understood it, and then it responds to other influences, so it can adjust its navigation. How come there aren't so many other influences that it just doesn't fly around randomly? Uh, some other influences from, you mean just from well, other stray so got magnetic two free, fields? As I understood it, it's got, there are two or more free radicals as a result of the mm. photon hitting something in the retina, one of which is aligned to the Earth's magnetic field. We think, you think, somebody thinks. I, I, I don't think it's it one, two free radicals. So basically, two electrons that were part of a, a pair that one spins up and one spin, spins down. When that, uh, uh, the, the, you get these free radicals and the bonds break, electrons, one electron can jump from one atom to another. So these electrons remain entangled uh, correlated, connected with each other, their fates are intertwined, even though they're on different atoms. And it's that pair of electrons that is sensitive to the Earth's magnetic field, or namely, how the pair are spinning. Um, in quantum mechanics, we talk about whether electrons are in a, a, a spin triplet state or a spin singlet state, depending on whether they're spinning the same direction or opposite directions. And it's how much of the time they are spinning in the same direction compared with opposite direction that is affected by the orientation in the magnet. So it's, I, I guess it's the, the axis of the alignment of that it, pair of electrons that is sensitive to the Earth's magnetic field, not one free radical Yeah, I mean, atom. as I understand it, it's not that you have a reference spin and some other one. It's the, the, the real point is that there is, it should be a gradient in the magnetic field strength um, because you have the sort of background Earth magnetic field, but then you have the idea is, you know, some atoms are magnetic. So you will have a, a, a gradient in the field. And it's the different, as Jim says, the different populations of these different spin states, the triplet and the singlet, that uh, is the kind of basis of the sensing mechanism. And that, that is sensitive to that gradient. And if there are other, uh, other magnetic fields... The, the nucleus, uh, the, the electron fields, the magnetic field of the atomic nucleus, I mean, that's a much more important effect. The, uh, the, what's, what's incredible, I mean, it was even, I think it was the chemist Peter Atkins in the 70s, uh, really, he said, you know, people who think magnetic fields can affect chemical reactions are charlatans. You know, this does not happen. Uh, and, and in particular, the Earth's magnetic field, which is so, so weak. 
uh, you know, uh, it's a hundred times weaker than a fridge compass. And uh, I stick a fridge compass on my head, I'm not going to feel it or go all, you know, crazy. Uh, the Earth's magnetic field is so weak, and yet, how is it these animals, they do, they, that, that's not, I, I think, in any doubt that, that, that animals use the Earth's magnetic field for navigation. The question is, how can that weak magnetic field influence over and above the other forces that are controlling the, 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 the behavior of these electrons such that they can discriminate their orientation in it? Yeah. And, and we should say, this is still not... Uh, um, confirmed experimentally. What is confirmed is the animals sense the Earth's magnetic field. What we're trying to understand is what is the physical mechanism that allows them to do that. Essentially, this is the only theory in town at the moment. Yeah. It may be wrong, uh, but someone come up with another explanation for how it works, and then we can, and we'd have to start thinking about how ways of, of actually testing what theory is correct, which is you know, the way science works. John Joe, and in the middle there, and then the front there. So this is my, my, my co-author is going to ask Phil a very tricky question. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Well, I'll try. <laughs> uh, thanks for a very, very nice talk. Um, I want to return to the question which is kind of central to uh, quantum biology as to whether it's really functional or, or kind of accidental. And it kind of reminds me of the older days of how controversial theories uh, uh, come about and get accepted or not. Uh, first of all, it's considered, a theory is considered nonsense, and then it's considered kind of, well, maybe it's possible. And after that, it's, well, it's inevitable, it's obvious. <laughs> some, some way, in some way, the quantum biology is a bit like that, but it's a real problem that once you deal with individual molecules, uh, individual molecule, uh, uh, protons and electrons inside biomolecules, you kind of think that, well, quantum mechanics is kind of going to be inevitable. Can you think of what kind of experiment, what kind of, uh, how you would nail it in quantum mechanics being really functional rather than inevitable? Yeah, I mean, that, that, I, I think that is the, the really hard question. And, uh, it, it, it's not easy to, uh, I mean, I, I'm certainly not going to come, come up with an experiment off the top of my head to answer that question, except to say that th that general question of whether what we see happening in a biochemical system is adaptive or not is always a hard thing to, um, to, to determine. And, you know, sometimes I think too readily there's the instinct to assume that it is, to assume that everything we see in biological systems got that way because it was an adaptation. And I think um, we're starting to see um, you know, how complex that, that question sometimes is. Some people think, for example, and I think there are very good arguments um, to suggest this, that a lot of the complexity in higher organisms isn't adaptive, that it's something that happened almost as a byproduct of natural selection rather than because of it. Um, so, you know, I think that there's, that evolutionary, thinking in evolutionary biology has probably got more sophisticated in recent years from the early days when you, we had suddenly this explanation for why things were the way they were and everyone was happy to say, well, of course it was adaptive. Um, and now we realize that there's a lot that happens in biology that isn't. Um, but exactly how you determine whether it is or, 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 or not is extremely difficult to, to figure out. Um, so, you know, that doesn't answer your question, but it's to say it's a very hard question and one that we're going to have to think very hard to, to, to answer. I think, to my, to my mind, I, I'm almost not as interested in that issue. I think we've had this discussion before whether if quantum effects take place in biology, whether it's adaptive, whether evolutionary forces have, you know, the, the, those organisms or mechanisms that could make use of quantum mechanics did so and therefore were more successful, or whether it was inevitable or happened. That's not as interesting to me as a physicist uh, as much as the fact that non-trivial quantum mechanics is seen to take place in an, in an unexpected uh, system. Uh, that, you know, the question then is, is there something special about life? Is there something that life uh, can do that inanimate matter of equal complexity can't do, a la Schrodinger, you know, unless you freeze it down to near absolute zero? Is there something special about life? Well, there clearly is, but is that something special 
in a sense, due to quantum mechanics. Yeah. Whether it's inevitable or whether it's, it's, it's uh, evolved to make use of it, I'm sort of not, not that fussed. The fact that it, it's there is, is exciting enough for That's me. That's why he's a physicist. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, Phil, thank you for a fa fascinating talk. Uh, as a chemist, I've got a question for you about enzymes. You know, the enzyme you showed for the quantum tunneling, that was a, it was a, a redox enzyme. I think it was lactate dehydrogenase. Has this phenomenon mainly been seen with these enzymes, or has it been seen with other ones, such as, for example, enzymes involved in methyl transfers? Yeah. I, you know, I, Fred, I can't, that's a good question. I can't answer it. I can't remember the, um, you know, w all, all the details of which enzyme have been looked at. Um, so, I mean, do, do you know, can you remember which enzymes? Um, uh, well, I mean, it started off, the group uh, in, in, in Berkeley was doing the work uh, mostly in the 80s, but now we've got people, there's a, there's a chap called Nigel Scruton uh, in Manchester who's doing a lot of work on enzymes, and I think what, is hap what we're seeing now is that there are more and more uh, enzymes that seem to promote proton transfer through, through tunneling. Uh, John Joe might have a list off the top of his well, head. Well, Nigel's going to excuse me. Uh, no, no, yes, if you, talks, if you, if you come so along come to, to part to three answer. of, of oh, this I event I am already. and ask that question <laughs> yeah. then, you'll have, you'll have a world expert yes. on exactly and, that point. And also <laughs> about photo, um, photosynthetic systems, when you think about it, that arrangement is the perfect nanomachine in nature when you think about it. So it's obvious, so even I think the best things we can are not that good yet. Yeah, that, so that is that. We, no, we have no model for comparing, and no sort of synthetic no, model right. for comparing it with. Well, it, al product. although chemists are trying, of course, to do this to to, to develop artificial photosynthetic yeah. mm. systems that could be tremendously valuable yes, um, as, hydrogen, for energy for harvesting. Yes, and and producing hydrogen if we can make them. So the question then becomes: Are they going to have to think about if if this is what what is happening in nature? Are they going to think about how to get quantum coherence in these systems? In in a world of research where uh, when we apply for grants, we seem to increasingly these days have to put in the relevance and applications and impact of the research. Mm -hmm. I predict that those who want to do research in quantum biology yeah. will quite often be making use yeah. of the fact we need well, to understand whether quantum mechanics plays a role in photosynthesis because that will help us uh, build better, more, more efficient energy. That, so that's that. what happens <laughs> when you live in a world governed by failed lawyers and um, accountants mm -hmm. and second-rate arts graduates. Quite. <laughs> <laughs> okay, some more, some more questions. Okay, so there's one there, and, and one down here, and then there. Okay, I'll keep... Okay, thank you. Hi. <laughs> Great stuff. Um, can I take you back to the old factory? I'm over here. All right. <laughs> um, take you back to the old factory, uh, the smell system. Uh, great, really interesting. Um, Organic molecules have got loads of hydrogen atoms all over them. I think one of the diagrams you had deuterium on all, almost every hydrogen atom. But we can label these molecules individually, put deuterium in different places, or indeed we've got tritium. So is being able to put these labels in different parts of the molecule anything way help us understand whether these theories you've mentioned are right or not? Or am I sort of... <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, it, I mean, it should. Um, I mean, uh, the, the, in the example I showed, and, you know, it really had been deuterated to that extent, and that was because I, I showed, uh, I, I won't click back to it, but I showed two molecules, one of them with these carbon deuterium bonds all over, um, and the other with, at the end, there was a, a, a carbon uh, nitrogen group, a nitrile, it's triple bonded there, and it just so happens that those two bonds have a very similar vibrational frequency. Um, so, you know, th th that was really the, the idea there, that that was, you know, that, that was why those two molecules seemed to be, um, uh, to, to be triggering the same olfactory response in fruit flies. Um, so I, my understanding there is that, it, 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 that as long as you have a, a carbon deuterium vibration, uh, then you, know, you should see some similarity in the way the, 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 the two molecules are sensed. Um, but I don't know, I mean, it may be that they have done experiments where they've had different degrees of deuteration. I'm really not sure, but I suppose if you're only worrying about whether you have a carbon deuterium vibration you know, of some sort in the molecule, then maybe that, you know, that's, that's not crucial. Yes. 
effect of temperature on quantum. So um, you were saying before, sort of like the way that quantum computers function, they need to be cooled to very low temperatures, a few degrees above zero K. Um, but then you were saying the effect in quantum biology, obviously biological processes and chemical processes happen at higher temperatures. So I was just wondering what sort of the effect of temperature when we conduct experiments, we have to cool them down to very low temperatures. So I just wondered how that sort of affects it. Does the cooler temperatures just slow it down so that we can observe it more or do they simply not work? Because in a com quantum computer, would they not work at sort of higher temperatures? I mean, this is the weird thing about the whole idea of quantum biology, isn't it? That, that, that um, we are used to the idea, physicists are used to the idea that you're only going to see quantum effects at these very low temperatures where the disturbance that you're getting from all the jiggling around of the environment has, you know, largely been, has largely gone away. Um, and all sorts of quantum effects, you know, only make themselves seen in those situations. It's why superconductivity, which is a quantum effect, only seems to appear at very low temperatures um, and so that's the mystery why it is if, if it is the case that uh, that you see these things like quantum coherence at everyday temperatures in living systems how can that be how how do how has you know biology arranged things that way um, that's you know that that's the question mm. that's the mystery well, I mean what do you think uh, well, you got thoughts about how that it's possible. Yeah, it I mean, I th the, the back of the envelope calculations suggest that that's why physicists were so sort of shocked that you could see, some, for instance, in photosynthesis, this quantum coherence lasting for biological times. So how can it be? We predict, according to the calculations, that the, the, the system decoheres, the quantum weirdness leaks away within femtoseconds, 10 to the minus 15 of a second. And here you've got this thing lasting for millions of times longer. Um, the, the current thing is that those, the, the temperature, another way of saying temperature is say how much noise or how many, how much vibrations there are of all, you know, the molecules, uh, the, the, the big biomolecules, the bonds between them, the water molecules, because inside the cell it's basically liquid. There's all this jiggling and, and lots of motion uh, that we can call temperature, that noise that should be killing uh, the, uh, the delicate quantum effects. It's, there are, there's a, there's a, um, uh, a group in Ulm University, uh, there's a big research group led by a chap called Martin Plenio, who suggests that actually that, that noise, the temperature the vibrations, is at precisely the right frequency to resonate with things like quantum tunneling and so on and coherence. So actually, it uses it to its advantage to maintain quantum effects for even longer, um, which then comes back to this question of, well, how come? You know, is, is therefore this something that somehow life has selected, had, has hit upon and made use of? If it's inevitable, can we see a similar sort of thing in, 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 in other systems? Can we set it up in our lab? And I think it's simply too early to say. We're seeing these papers appearing in, you know, the top journals. This is not, you know, cranky uh, sort of uh, people on the, on the outside of mainstream science. These are papers published in Nature and Science, the top journals, uh, where they are, they're trying to get to grips with how how th th this can happen in biology despite these high temperatures. And I think it's simply too early to know exactly what the right answer is. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks very much for a really interesting evening, gentlemen. I look forward to the next two events. Um, I'd just like to make a very brief comment to the gentleman over there who made sort of rather incredulous question about vibrating molecules and stuff like that. I, I did my physics over 50 years ago. I remember a big um, chunk of it was on molecular spectra, which was all about vibrating molecules. So this, these vibrating molecules have been well understood for a very long time. But my question actually to you gentlemen is this, um, where do you think the first Nobel Prize is going to come in quantum biology. And, uh, and would it be in physics or would it be in biology? <laughs> It'll be in chemistry. <laughs> That's the lovely thing about quantum biology. The quantum physicists stride out of their physics you know, in all arrogance, in the same way that you know, Bohr and Schrodinger and others did. Oh, you've got some problem in biology, apparently. You know, we're very clever. We'll sort it out. And the biologists are saying, no way. We need your nonsense, you quantum physicists. And whatsoever. We don't need anything. And, you know, and they're arguing. And the chemists say, uh, excuse me, we've been doing this thing for years you know, with our, our spectroscopy and so on. And it seems the chemists do understand these problems. A lot of the systems that we now try to learn in, bio, in um, biochemistry actually 
uh, are, are being done and, and looked at, have been looked at by chemists for many years. So I suspect it will be the chemists who, uh, who, who, who may get their Nobel Prize first before the physicists or biologists. If, if, yeah, I think, yeah, I, I agree entirely. If it happens at all, then that's where it will... Uh, that, that's where it will happen. It's in the chemistry lab, chemical isn't it? problems, and you know that, that, that a great deal of, of uh, quantum-related research is chemical. That uh, people have won chemical uh, chemistry Nobel prizes for work in quantum <laughs> chemistry for understanding quantum theory of, of bonding. I mentioned Ariel Warshall, who's a Nobel laureate for his uh, of, uh, in chemistry for his work on um, how uh, enzymes behave. It wasn't actually for looking at tunneling, although he's done that as well. Um, so, you know, absolutely, I think understanding these systems at the molecular level is, is really chemistry. Chemists sometimes complain that all these you know, biochemists are, are getting the, their prize for working on proteins and things like this, but I think it just shows how broad chemistry is, actually. Okay, time for a couple more questions. Um, um, this is quite a simple question, but um, is tunneling passive or does it use energy and if so how does it gather it get it yeah yeah nice um, well, it, it, it doesn't tunneling doesn't need energy no i mean the particle if 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 it's able to get from one side of an energy barrier to another the whole point of tunneling is that it doesn't need sufficient energy to hop over the barrier. It leaks through without requiring any additional energy. That's, that's what makes it so strange and non-classical. Non yeah, I mean, tunneling uses probability, I suppose you could say. It exploits the fact that this is, um, it, you know, that, that this is how we have to describe the quantum world according to simply the probability of things being in different places. That's all you need. So occasionally it will pop up here. So, two questions at the top. Yes, one there, and then um, one there, I'm afraid, and then I'm afraid we do have to wrap up. Talking as an experimentalist, you've been talking about birds and you've been talking about fruit flies. How about bees? Um, thought for you, a bee finds its source of nectar, presumably again by magnetic fields, and it comes back to the beehive on a honeycomb and transmits that information to all the bees in the colony. If you turn that beehive upside down, does the bee go the other way? If you change the magnetic field on the, on the honeycomb, would it go the other way? And it seems to transfer that information to the whole hive of the bees without all those bees watching it going up and down the, the honeycomb. Is, is there a future for a, an experimental uh, beehive to, to see some of these uh, theories? And it might be much easier than your great experiment with the robins and cones and things. <laughs> Entangled bees. Um, uh, bees do align the honeycomb. They, they can sense magnetic fields, like Jim says, and they do align the comb to the uh, magnetic field. Um, so, you know, that much certainly is known. I mean, how they transmit the information to the, the, the rest of the community, as far as I understand it, they do these wonderful waggle dances to do that. Um, I don't know how much is known about what the information that they're conveying is there, but somehow, you know, they have that, that, that system. So they certainly don't need entangled brains to no. get that information across. It'd be nice to think that there are other quantum phenomena in nature, but uh, I don't think anyone would go as far as to say that anything that's weird and wonderful in the animal kingdom we can ascribe to quantum mechanics. <laughs> uh, that, that, will, that will be one step too far. <laughs> yes, so I think this has to be our final question. Um, you said in quantum computing, um, quantum bits are their equivalent ones and zeros. And then you went on to say, with superposition, uh, there's an intermediate state. How would that be encoded? I haven't quite got the hang of it. So the question in quantum computing, rather than simply having ones and zeros, you mentioned in, an intermediate state. What did you mean? Well, by that? not exactly an intermediate state. I mean a different state. Um, that, you know, if you think of a classical bit, say um, a magnetic bit that can be oriented one way or the other, it can be a one or it can be a zero. Um, whereas a quantum system can be in both of those states. 
at the same time. Um, and it can be in different mixtures of those states to different degrees at the same time. So you have the, the crude way of thinking about it, it is a crude way, is that you just have more states available um, for quantum bits than you do for classical bits. And so you can do more, you can do more computation. And that is a crude way of saying it because it's a sort of little admitted, I think, sometimes uh, fact about quantum computing that although there are clear theories that show that you can get faster computation using uh, these quantum bits, it still isn't clear quite why that's so. And in fact, it's not even clear that there is a single explanation for where that so-called quantum speed up comes from. And some people have argued that it's not really about the fact that you have all these superpositions in different states and you're doing lots of parallel processing. Although I should say that um, David Deutsch, who started the whole idea of quantum uh, computing, suggests that in effect what you're doing, you're using these many worlds. You're doing just, you have a different computer in each world and it's doing all the comp computation together. Um, but there are some people now who are saying it's actually a different quantum property, um, a, a more complex co quantum property that, uh, that is responsible for the speed up, at least in some of these cases. So all I really want to say is that although it's kind of vaguely clear why quantum computation might in some systems, in some situations, be faster, it's really still not understood quite why that should be so. Do, would you agree? Yeah, that, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and we do have to wrap up there, I'm afraid. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, when I um, to make my programmes for BBC4, I'm told by the commissioning editors that BBC4 audiences, which I'm sure uh, you are all uh, part of, um, don't necessarily have to understand everything about a documentary about quantum physics. They want to be made to feel clever. I think it's... <laughs> in the nicest possible way, I think we can all go away this evening in the knowledge that Philip Ball has made us feel that little bit more clever. Let's all thank him once again. Thank you.